So uh, welcome back um, for this panel discussion. Sorry about that. Uh, we have four um, distinguished panelists here today. Um, so um, first we have uh, Daniel Barr. Uh, he is since 2018 Director General for the Swedish Pension Agency. Uh, and then Nini Franceschi, she comes from uh, Nordea Wealth Management, where she's head of private banking Sweden. And before that, head of sales and distribution, savings and wealth offerings. And then we have Eric Teden, uh, is the director general of the Swedish Financial Supervisory Authority since 2015. And among other things, member of the management board of the European Security and Markets Authority. And finally, Sven Hagstromer, um, he is a financial executive and entrepreneur. He has been active in the Swedish financial market since the early 70s, but maybe he's best known as the founder of online bank Avanza and investment company Creades. Both of them are listed on in the Stockholm Stock Exchange. Yeah, so uh, maybe Daniel, if you want to come out first and I know that you have some slides you want to share. Yeah, uh, so the um, headline of this um, uh, panel is how can consumer welfare be improved in the financial markets? Well, in the pension era, it's pretty clear it's by, by good design of the system and, and by, by constructing good default, as some of your speaker already talked about. Uh, first, some uh, general information about the Swedish pension system to understand this. I think Olivia presented uh, a pension system like a three-legged stool. In, in Sweden, we prefer to present the pension system as a pyramid where the base consists of a uh, public pension. Uh, and in Sweden, we have a public pension consisting of two uh, parts, the income pension, which is a notional DC system. And a small part is also a funded part, the premium pension system, where you can pick mutual fund. Uh, and if you're not picking uh, mutual funds, your, your money is invested in a default fund. On top of that, most people, I think like 90% of all individuals in the workforce have an occupational pension. Uh, the old systems are on DB and the, the young one, which is well, older than, younger than 20 years, are RDC system here. And then you can have a private pension system, an insurance company or, or saving in a house or, 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 or whatever. Uh, and in the system, uh, the, the individual had to do a lot of uh, choices, um, investment choices. As I mentioned, the premium pension system in the public part, uh, but it could, could also be uh, investment choices in the occupational scheme and in your private uh, pension scheme as well. But there are others, other choices as well. Uh, the age of picking up your pension is, is one of them. Uh, there are flexible pension ages uh, for, in the government or the public uh, pension scheme. You can start to uh, withdraw your pension from 61. Uh, the occupational schemes are already from 55. Uh, so you have to make a choice there. Uh, if you wait, your pension will be higher, of course. Um, in some system, uh, including ours, uh, you can choose a payoff product. Uh, in our case, uh, you can choose among a unit linked insurance product where you invest in your own money, or you can choose a, to, to buy a, what what's called with, uh, with profit annuity, where, where we guarantee you a certain uh, low, very low return, but you can have a, a you, you, you get the profit as well if, if you, the return is higher than that. Um, you can also pick a survivor benefit. Um, if your spouse or, or children is, is going to inherit your, your money if you die early. And also important, the payout length. Um, in the public sector, it's all, always lifelong, but in the occupational scheme and, and the private savings scheme, you can often uh, pick a five, 10 or 20 year or time limited 
uh, annuity or a lifelong. So there's a lot of choices. And I would say uh, the, import, the importance of default option, I will try to show in the next few slides in all these, these areas. But first, uh, some words on the um, clever design of systems. Uh, I mentioned the premium pension systems where people can pick um, uh, among 500 funds to invest their own pension money in the public scheme. Today, it's around 500 mutual funds to, to pick uh, among. I will come back to that. Uh, one, uh, one result from research is, is that, um, uh, which is often called choice overload, me means that if you have many choices, the number of active persons decrease. And I think one uh, winner from, from the Scan Scandia uh, Swedish House of Finance uh, reward um, in behavioral economics showed that if you add another 10 funds, the activities is, is uh, decreasing by 2%. In our system, we have 500 um, mutual funds. Uh, so if you do the math, uh, according to that, there will be no activity whatsoever uh, within the system. We will come back and, and see how that looks. In this slide, uh, which is uh, well, pretty much uh, the, the forecast from, from, from the award-winning um, uh, paper, uh, shows that the newcomers into the system, uh, the one that actually do an active choice, is quite close to zero, like as, as the yellow, yellow uh, uh, graph, graph at, at, at this slide. Uh, however, um, when um, um, the, when, when time lapses, uh, there, there will be accumulated money on the account. So some, some of the people are, are, are making active cho choices uh, going forward. Uh, and you can see from the graph that after 15 years or something, uh, around 20% uh, or something like that more are, are doing an active choice. But the, a lot of people end up in the default fund. And uh, I would like to underline, and I think several speakers have done that, uh, to have a, a well-designed default fund is, is crucial here. In, in Sweden, there is a life cycle fund with the high equity content that actually has outperformed most of the, at least the average of the, of the private alternatives on, on, on the platform. There is a discussion now if one should have one default fund from the accumulation phase or and one from the the accumulation phase that, that differs going forward, but that's a, on the political level discussed at the moment. This is a, a way to show the importance of, of default here. Uh, it's, it's, uh, the, it sh shows the numbers uh, that select the with profit annuity in, in our system compared to those that choose uh, the, def the unit linked fund alternative. And as you can see, it, it uh, around well, 15, 20%, something like that, until uh, 2010. Then someone in the organization further down changed the form. So instead of having one box to tick for, for the with profit annuity, uh, they introduced two boxes, one from the with profit annuity and one from the unit linked um, uh, alternative. So from going from being a default, the unit linked, uh, the, the number of people that actually choose the, the with profit annuity spiked to 50%. Then the board of the pension authority got somewhat nervous and changed it back, changed the form back. And then the number of the, the share of, of, of people that actually choose the um, with profit annuity product also dropped back to the, the 20% where it still is. So this is a one illustration of the importance of defaults. Uh, another important one is, is the pension age. Um, in, in Sweden, by regulation and, and, and um, in the public opinion, 65, 65 years has been the age of, of the pension age in Sweden. Uh, that um, been loosened by regulation, but also the politician has pointed out that we have a flexible pension age in Sweden. Uh, and over time, uh, the number uh, of people um, 
retiring at 65 has decreased, as you can see from the orange part here of the, of, of, of the slide, from like three quarters down to one quarter is now retiring at, at 65 uh, by a, a looser nudge on 65, to, so, so to say, all the time, still, still in, uh, decreasing. Uh, a couple of more examples on the importance of default is the survivor benefits. Uh, the two first line here are, are uh, two occupational schemes from the uh, local government sector. And as you can see, if you have a default uh, from, from um, having a survivor benefits, uh, the, the pickup rate is much higher than, than uh, if it's not a default. And the same in the two second lines are from the central government sector. We you can see, for example, in the savings phase, mm -hmm. uh, where the default is, is, is um, uh, that you have a survival benefit protection, there's a pickup rate of 97%, while uh, in a similar system for the same type of, of, of workers, uh, where, where non uh, ship survivor benefits are, are included, the, the pickup rate is only 2%. So it's, it's, it's very important here. Lastly, um, the, uh, and, and not least important is, is the, um, is the uh, payout, payout phase. Should you choose a, a time-limited one, like five, ten years, or, or a lifelong year? And here are two examples. Uh, when you have a five-year payout default, which is also in the central government sector, there is a uh, zero um, uh, percent that that choose a lifelong. When when you have a lifelong as the default, there is ninety six percent that 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 end up with a lifelong insurance here. The second example here is from the local government sector, which now, they didn't change the uh, default; they just changed the information that was sent out to the to the members, uh, and, and um, made made it less. Uh, visible that that, that five-year uh, period will, will result in higher uh, higher pension, and just by by changing the information, the uh, the the, um, the pickup for 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 lifelong annuity rose from twenty-five to to fifty-four uh, percent. So summing up, uh, um, clever design of pension system and, and clever design on default solutions are very important in order to improve welfare in the pension sector. Thank you. Uh, perfect. Um, thank you very much. Uh, this was extremely interesting and uh, uh, kind of lines up very well with the, uh, with the, with the arguments that uh, uh, Luis was making that Actually, there are a number of improvements we could already implement in this type of systems. Now I turn to Nini Franceschi. Uh, please, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Happy to be here. Um, I'm representing uh, a bank, as you mentioned in the introduction. Thank you for that. Um, it's Nordia, and we have quite a lot of customers, as you all know, in, in all market segments, basically. Right now I'm heading up the private bank and there we have a very, very close interaction and close relationship with our customers. So I will focus here merely on sort of the broader bank, basically what we do in order to help out improving consumer and customer welfare. Uh, as mentioned before, I think there's a lot of, of questions and choices that, that consumers are, are um, put uh, in front of to, to make these decisions. Uh, I believe that financial advisors and experts can actually be of help and assistance here. Um, and that is basically to, to ensure that we gradually achieve more knowledgeable and insightful consumers, customers, which I think is super good for the bank, of course, uh, because they be, will be more happy customers if they are more prepared and if they know more what they are consuming in terms of financial services in general, including pension products, but also to society at large. Uh, what we do concretely, uh, how we try to help out here as a bank, uh, can be di divided into basically two themes or two ways of communicating with customers. 
firstly, I would say that we support them in a more broad, general uh, uh, communication and educational level where we uh, communicate to many, experts communicating to many in various sets and forms that could be webinars, lecture series, events, uh, and so forth. And then we also have the more personal and individual communication and advice that is one-to-one, -one, of course. Uh, when it comes to the first one, um, sort of closing the information gap that one can actually confirm that we do have, um, we see that, for example, that younger customers in particular, we made a study in 19, and I know that several of you know this already, but it sort of confirms the picture that young people don't really have the basic knowledge that they maybe could benefit from when it comes to pr basic private financials. Um, for example, every second lacked insight and knowledge about the basics. Six out of 10 did not know how to pay a bill. Every third did not know uh, which credits to avoid and so forth. Uh, and if you mention the pension system, of course, that is also something that they would not really have much insights too. But what we do then is to, to head, uh, head up these lecture series and so forth, but also to partner up with schools, attend classrooms, um, uh, cooperating with something called economy pale in schools. Uh, I don't know the English translation for that, but it's a collaboration between banks, organizations and schools in Sweden to help them improve their sort of basic knowledge and we recently also uh, released a lecture series for our customers in wealth management on how we make as humans make financial decisions uh, fairly behavior oriented so that consumers can become more aware of, of uh, how they basically reason around financials. Um, this, of course, risk, run the risk of being information overload and also that it's not personalized. So, of course, we need to combine this with being sort of very close to the customers and having relationship-driven advisory. So, we have one-to-one -one meetings, digital and physical. Branches are decreasing in Sweden, as we probably see all over, but we're still, um, we are still at 110, more than 110 locations in Sweden. Um, so we can reach out and meet customers and have the individual advice sessions. Um, though I could also mention that digital is of course increasing and you can be still very personal and relationship driven, being sort of need based and explain and communicate uh, what investments are really about uh, in that kind of, of meetings. Um, and talking about choices and so forth, I think it's super good if you combine these two because it's very, very related to activity levels and how you behave and how often you want to make decisions on your investments, for example, or your pension, um, how active you want to be. And you have to have a profound understanding on what it takes to actually manage a portfolio of single securities versus using a managed solution, for example. And that is easier to communicate and adopt when, when the, the uh, uh, person is, um, yeah, when you have one-to-one -one meeting. And of course, I mean, to reach out, of course, we have also um, took this uh, robo-advice tools into practice. So we have an online channel for that, basic advice. You also get the pension advice that way. Um, more than half a million visitors since 2018. Um, it seems to be merely a majority of, of the users have not had savings or pension savings with Nordea beforehand. So obviously digital is growing fastly and that is a very, very good way to communicate and help out sort of improving uh, the, the knowledge among uh, consumers and customers. So I would say that is where we can help and we have to also drive accessibility by being there when there's a crisis. We saw that in Corona right now that we had, uh, but also when they want to make more uh, bigger financial decisions or when something is perceived a bit boring and complex, which I must unfortunately say pension sometimes is 
a bit perceived that way. But I think I will stop there because I know that you have a lot of uh, interesting other panel participants. Thank you, Nini. Thank you so much. Um, so now I give uh, the word to Anders. Yeah, okay. So uh, thanks very much. Um, next uh, panelist is um, Erik Tedén, um, Director General at the uh, uh, Financial Supervision Authority. The screen is yours. Thank you very much. I hope that you hear me now. Uh, so uh, I will basically pick up on, on, on two subjects. One is uh, uh, regarding advice uh, and, and what we've seen there as, uh, as a supervisory authority, a little bit what's going on there and also a little bit on, on, on credits. Uh, but let me first say that I, 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 I definitely agree with Daniel that the, 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 the power of defaults and the, the importance of having a architecture. And I think that is extremely, extremely topical in Sweden as the pension group within the parliament is actually just as we speak more or less discussing this and how to potentially reform the, the system. So, but generally speaking, fundamentally, there is a uh, uh, extensive uh, need of consumer protections in uh, these markets. Uh, most of us completely are completely dependent on the services, uh, and we typically have a very, very low understanding of concepts and math needed to understand. Uh, and this has also, of course, been commented in this, uh, in this seminar before. So we are, as consumers, by default, as the disadvantage in the relationship with the institutions that provide these services. Uh, most institutions, I must say, as, as an introduction, are serious uh, when it comes to how they do their business and also when it comes to advice. But of course, all of them uh, uh, face strong uh, financial incentives to attract and keep customers. And what we often see is that that uh, tends to uh, bring about complex, co complex products uh, and, and uh, expensive products. And that, those two actually go in line with each other because the more complex they are, the, the harder is it to, do, to understand and even to describe the, the costs involved. Uh, the way consumers behave when uh, purchasing financial services also has a concrete uh, implication of financial stability. I think we going back to 08 and the mis-selling of credit, uh, especially in the US, uh, I think it's a good example. So there is an interlink between actually two of the missions that uh, the Swedish FSA high have, namely financial, uh, financial stability and consumer protection. Uh, they are definitely interlinked. Uh, so let me say a few words then on financial advice. You could say that in the supervisory world, regulatory world, there's been a struggle between the ones that want to have a ban on inducements. Uh, we were actually one of them as an institution back in, uh, back in that time. Uh, and, uh, and other countries, and of course, uh, many of the people from the, from, the, from the sector wanted to have still advice, but maybe regulate how you, you should uh, go about when it comes to advices. Well, the result we all know, there was no ban generally in Europe uh, for, for banning inducements. Some countries did it anyway, but Sweden didn't. So now there is a very, very uh, kind of strong uh, regulation that uh, the, uh, uh, the institutions, the financial service institutions should uh, uh, take into account, uh, not take into account, but actually uh, 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 when construction products, they should only focus on what's good for their clients. And after construction, constructing the, the product, they, when, when advising, they should always, all, all only have the needs of the consumer uh, at the forefront. So that means, of course, that you know, generally speaking, a, 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 a consumer with a low understanding of financial products, maybe with a low income, I guess, without being a financial advisor myself, they, they, they should probably be advised to have a, a fairly simple, a straightforward products with, with below costs. And, and you know, the, 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 the more, more knowledge and more wealth you get, you probably more risky and maybe, maybe also more complex. Uh, so that, this is kind of the general idea. So this regulation is pretty, it's pretty new and we have now tested it also in our supervision. I will tell you, 
uh, about uh, one of these cases. We, uh, a couple of weeks ago, no, it was actually before the summer, we uh, redraw the license of one of the firms called Exceed. Uh, they sold very complex and often very expensive structured products without making sure consumers understood the risks and costs with the investments. Uh, for some products, the fees a consumer paid were more than 40%. And I will get you through very, very quickly one of these products. It was a structured note with a high yield bond as an underlying duration, seven years. Exposure was the underlying index of 75 European high yield corporate bonds. The upfront cost was 10% of the principal, so 60,000 60, out of 600,000, for example. The dividend indicated was 9.75%. The return of the principal uh, was a return in full after four, uh, seven years if, if no more than nine credit events had have occurred. If more than nine credit uh, events occurred, the principal is reduced by 10%. So if nine or more credit events occur during the seven years, the dividend payments and the principal is reduced. And after 17 credit events, everything is lost. So what is the credit event? It's not only a default of one of the underlying bonds, it could actually be, for example, a late payment of interest and understanding. This is for sure a complex product and extremely ex expensive product. I could say that uh, on a personal note that I actually met one of my friends who had a father uh, that passed away that had this product in his, uh, in his accounts. Uh, and, and that man was a really nice man, but he was not a, a, a financial expert. So I think that tells a story, actually a pretty tragic story. Uh, okay, so let me say a few words also about credits. I think what we see now in the credit market, which I think is a great concern of ours, is the speed uh, of which consumer can make decisions. So there's a lot of things with the digital, digitalization, which of course is a, is a merit that's very good for consumers. But to take a decision uh, uh, to take a loan of 100 or 200 or 300,000 kroner within minutes or half a day, I think, raises a lot of questions whether that is really a responsible way of, of handling, handling a, a credit, uh, credit situation or credit discussion with a client. Uh, so, and also some institutions today re rely on minimal information about consumers when granting loans. Without enough information, some creditors cannot make uh, the assessment of the individual that they, they will, will, are about to grant a, a, a loan. So, I think uh, that people who cannot afford to pay back loan may be granted uh, uh, nonetheless. So, I think this is uh, extremely uh, worrisome and also the, the, the whole discussion of over in depthness to some extent I think is due to the uh, kind of the how, how these firms handle these kind of credits. Uh, so how am I with time here? Uh, I'm okay? Okay, fine. Then I will, will, will uh, uh, sorry for that. Uh, so what we have uh, been following this market more in depth for, for a couple of years and we noticed that fairly large shares of new loans, about 40% of the new loans are over 100,000 and they are used to pay off one or several smaller loans. So you probably, if you're based in Sweden anyway, and probably the same in other countries, there's a lot of ads in, in radio and television around this that you should just take a little bit bigger loan and then you can pay off all your expensive small credits and then uh, everything is much better and the interest rate is lower and that's true often the interest rate is lower on this kind of loan that you take to pay off other loans uh, the problem however is that um, uh, what what typically happens is that that loan then is kind of uh, uh, this could be a good thing but most consumer loans use constant payment methods instead of straight line amortization so in cases with medium to high interest rates this results in a repayment plan where consumers pay mostly interest rates the first one or two years when such, when such a loan is constantly being substituted for a new loan. The repayment plan starts over and over and new years with mostly interest rate pay, payments begin. So basically you have a loan forever for a very long time, which you basically pay a still very high interest rate on. So this is also an example where 
people are focused on the interest rates and not then understanding that the fact that they keep this loan for so many years by renewing it all the time is actually something that is extremely, extremely costly. So to conclude, strong consumer protection is a prerequisite for ensuring welfare of consumers on the financial markets. Uh, and of course, this is a balancing act uh, and an ongoing process, but in essence, the disparity between consumers and producers on financial markets are, uh, are, are coupled with a strong correlation also with the real economy and means that strong consumer protection uh, is actually also a good and even a prerequisite for financial stability. Uh, and according to the new legislation, this we'll see how this turns out, but uh, I think we need to be a little bit skeptical here. Financial firms, they need to demonstrate that they are mindful of consumers' interests and consider consumer needs and circumstances when, uh, when giving advice. So uh, I think I'll stop there and, and open for questions now or later. Thanks. Thanks very much, Eric. Uh, sorry to have kept you waiting, Sven. You've been uh, with us all day. <laughs> now it's uh, your turn. So you have a very long experience in the financial markets and also um, have uh, been one of the persons behind the technical revolution about uh, investment banking in Sweden, founding Avanza. So it'd be very interesting to hear your comments about all this. Thank you very much, Anders. Uh, first of all, I just a little word about the background picture. I wanted to give our foreign participants an idea of what the Swedish currency could be. <laughs> it's, it's really nice. Uh, and um, thanks very much for giving your layman the opportunity to speak before this extremely distinguished group. The markets have gone a long way since liberalization. When I founded my own brokerage firm in 1980, I had to have an explicit permission from the Swedish equivalent to the SEC to decrease the commission rates. So things have really happened. Since deregulation and my start of the online brokerage firm, now Bank Avanza, more than 20 years ago, commission rates have decreased by 90%. Avanza has now more than 1.1 million customers, more than 10% of the Swedish population. We are only uh, uh, reaching out to Swedish uh, customers. Increased competition where lifelong relations are a thing of the past together with the development of internet and customer experience are the main factors behind our success. Not to mention all the free services we have introduced. By the way, I got access to the internet and my first mail account 1993. It was a fantastic experience. I remember sitting in front of the glass screen 36 hours in a row, accessing the internet with 9,600 BPS dial up modem. The speed of lightning was slow at the time. Without sleep and no need for food, I believe it could be compared to a religious experience. Access to limitless information at the touch of your fingertips, exactly the starting point for disruption in many industries. I tried to pinpoint the winners. I found two obvious businesses that would benefit most, finance and pornography. The choice for me was easy. I'm today more than happy that I entered the right bandwagon. In the old days, banks and brokers supplied their customers with a toolbox and a craftsman, the broker. But whose interest did he safeguard? In the world of internet, a toolbox, a toolbox would need some do-it-yourself skills and interest. The absent craftsman is really a main selling point, missed by nobody. Now the customer is occupying the driver's seat, still the road at times can be very bumpy. We have tried to make the customer experience like a journey to financial independence. Households are, as Louise says, generally still poorly equipped to handle financial decisions on their own due to inherent psychological biases, poor financial literacy, and lack of time, and the last, lack of interest. We all think that we are better drivers than the average. That is fortunately not the case with personal investing. People are generally aware of their shortcomings. When it comes to literacy, 
we have our own Avanza Academy to help our customers become, become better decision makers. The better our customers are off, the better we are off. Thanks, Anna Maria, for your P5 index. What a stimulating principle you would be at our academy. I will certainly look more into this and certainly compare the results from our customers with customers at the other banks. I 100% agree with Anna Maria that financial literacy should be begin in school. Eric referred to the crash of 2008. This gives another perspective on the question of financial literacy, but with a group that should be the best equipped, the professionals, the financial Ill illiteracy in real terms, I would dare to say, was higher on the professional side than with the private individuals. Why is consumer interest in buying the cheapest milk, etc., higher than looking after your lifelong savings? It is per perhaps boring to some, but is it really more fun to buy milk? The final question should be, where can you influence your present value the most? The gaming industry has been in the forefront when it comes to customer experience. We still have much to learn from, but we always have to remember that our customers' odds are much better. Transparency made a quantum leap with the internet. Unfortunately, the internet is also placed with lots of fake news where uninformed or misinformed consumer is at the losing end. Terence gave, gave us some, some interesting example who is today's Robin Hood? So in my world, transparency should be one of the most important pillars, if not the most important, for the regulatory authorities. Layer after layer of hidden cost for consumer is not the road, the road to earn credit for our industry. In this internet has made wealth advice more affordable, thereby helping to bridge the gap between rich and poor. Robert Weiser's is one track still in its infancy. Louis again, research, research in asset allocation and portfolio management has also given important insights in the design, design of portfolios for long horizon investors. And there is still plenty of low hanging fruit. I can only agree. In Sweden, consumer protection has been slow to evolve. In an analogy with what I said before, Milk has been in more focus for the politicians than financial services. Recently, however, things have been accelerating in the right direction. So looking forward, I see a market where more enlightened customers are guided by pers personal algorithms to help them make more accurate decisions with the support of AI. This means financial literacy is a growth market that we hope to exploit successfully. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. That was excellent. Um, so I guess we're going to open up some um, for some questions now in our QIA session. We don't have that much time, but um, so you mentioned this about uh, advice, which was also discussed by by Marini and Eric. And I, I think that maybe one potential problem here is that there are very few sources of independent advice in Sweden. Would that be? Would there be scope for? Uh, organ, organize that somehow. I know that uh, CFPB in the US has been um, one such attempt. Do you have any comments on that? I throw the question out of the virtual floor. Okay, I have a start. No, so I think the, the discussion when we had this uh, discussion of banning inducement was that uh, you know, we need in more of independent uh, advice. Uh, but uh, the argument against that was that no one could if we, we, we rely too much on independent advice that somebody should pay for, then we will have no advice. And that's so much worse than having uh, kind of dependent advice. I'm not really sure because again, there are some definitely serious players out there that are giving good advice, although they are kind of dependent advice, but there is also a big risk that the advice is so biased to selling again, complex and, and expensive products. Uh, I think the uh, AI and, and, and uh, uh, robo uh, advice is uh, maybe a, a, a hopeful route here because that, of course, should be substantially more less less expensive uh, to have as as a guide for for let's say consumers with not not that uh, much wealth. So so I think it's important to uh, 
uh, have more of independent advice, I think the technical change could be a, a Is, is there, was there anyone else want to comment on that or? That, okay, Paolo. Yeah, so the, I, I, I want to reflect a little bit on uh, um, the multitudes of, uh, kind of along the line uh, of what we just discussed, like the multitude of products that we are exposed to. Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware, but uh, recently I checked how many equity mutual funds are available out there. And we have 25,000 equity mutual fund funds available in the world and we have a total of 50,000 stocks listed. <laughs> so, you know, we have basically one mutual fund, equity mutual fund for every two stocks in the world. Uh, this is, is a, you know, there is an enormous amount of, of, of diversity. Yet, when we put down our foot and try to design a default system, we're going to use, you know, perhaps one or two products. Okay. So, and, and, and yet there is something in between, like Luis was saying, there, there are a bunch of low hanging fruits for introducing more than just a few products in order to customize much better the default system or the advice to, you know, to people. But to do that, you need to get information about who you have in front of you, which is something I think we actually can do much more, uh, you know, with, uh, with the internet, with access to information and so forth. Um, so, but I'm a little bit like, you know, puzzled by instead, um, you know, the extreme. We have an enormous amount of products and, and, uh, and I'm not sure that there is the right customization uh, in more, you know, uh, like, you know, when you go get advice from a bank or from a financial advisor. And here there is probably a lot of, there are a lot of issues on conflict of interest, uh, uh, commissions, selling your own products and so forth. On the other side, we have very few products in default and little customization. So I would like to go, just go around and think about how we can break this uh, kind of uh, vicious circle. Uh, and, uh, you know, both from a regulatory point of view, but also from the point of view of, of the bank, uh, of banks and, uh, uh, and innovation in, in financial markets. You talk more than keynotes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just a short answer, but, but uh, in order to address that extremely important question, uh, we have a marketplace for funds that we have uh, more, uh, about 2,000 funds that we are, uh, you know, giving all the, the, the different uh, 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 figures for the funds so our customers can, can, can compare the different funds, the costs, uh, where, where they are, the performance, Morningstar, you, you name it and you have all it. So, so, so it's, you, you know, that's, that's one of our services. We are, as a, as a grocer, you know, the marketplace in the middle of town, we, have, we are selling funds there. So, so, and, and then our customers can compare. And, and another thing is quite interesting. Uh, if we, we haven't talked gender this afternoon, but there's one thing I've seen and we have said, seen that generally, the, our female customers are better off than our male customers, and uh, that's maybe something. I think they are not as risk <laughs> risk oriented <coughs> as the male customers, but that's an interesting observation. Yeah, I think Terry Odin actually has some research on that. He can prove it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh -huh. that's interesting. So uh, we have to conclude now, uh, essentially. But um, I, I just want to throw one question out there. Um, about robo advice and 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 I guess uh, you know there's a dimension of trust here as well, which is uh, important I guess when it comes to to advice um, and does this work even digitally or is it that you pick up maybe young people that are more inclined to trust this new relatively new uh, uh, sort of online format do you do you have any experience on this? Well, I can just comment from, from Nordea that uh, our robot Nora uh, has actually uh, people from 18 up to 90. Uh, but what we see is basically that it's the first time savers mainly that get in there. But I think the, the general problem is how do you motivate someone to take care of their investments or savings or pension? And that is you have all this, uh, you have all the products, you have the financial services, we could have even better online platforms, but you have to make someone use it and understand what they are using. 
And that's where I still think that there's some, you know, need of some kind of financial advisor role also in the future in a more digital era. Uh, and of course, um, you always have to be very careful on how you reward financial advisors, all these things to ensure that it's not a conflict of interest. That is super important. Yeah. Yeah, I think we, we have some experience in the, in the pension uh, authority on, on um, offering digital decision support tools um, in the, over, over time. Uh, and I think people like them pre pretty much, but when it comes to important decision, they would like to speak to a human being. Have I understood everything correctly? Have I entered the right data? Uh, do I draw the right conclusion? So when it comes to important decision, I think as today it's, it's quite hard to get around the, the human intervention, in, at least in the end. Okay, so I would like to thank you. Uh, thank, uh, thanks, uh, our our uh, keynote speakers. Uh, I think it was uh, extremely interesting, uh, and uh, all the panelists that we had. Um, and uh, right now, uh, if you would like to spend some time, kind of discussing all these issues, we have actually set up a breakout room um, where most of us are going to be there to to take questions. Uh, and continue our discussion there. We can actually all talk, as far as I understood. Um, and the link for that room is in our chat function, if I'm not mistaken, hopefully. Uh, but you just click that, and then you will enter a new Zoom session where we can actually discuss more. Now, I, in thanking you, uh, I also, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of ask you to stay tuned to, for you know future conferences we might organize and future events that we are organizing here at the Swedish House of Finance. And uh, uh, please- we should, also, we should also mention there's an academic program tomorrow and on Wednesday That's right. at the same time. Uh, so we will have showcase eight academic papers with the discussions and they are all very, very interesting. Uh, so if you care to uh, zoom in for that, you're most welcome. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. And stay safe.